Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There is more information on the website womensdeclaration.com where you will find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 20,923 people from 140 countries. Oh, sorry. That was last week before a famous evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins, who has 2.9 million followers on Twitter, tweeted, please sign the declaration on women's sex based rights. I have just done so. So the actual thing is the declaration on women's sex based rights has been signed by 27,054 people from 154 countries and is supported by 400 organizations. If you are one of the new signatories, thank you for your support and welcome to Feminist Question Time. Um, As well as signatories, we have activists uh, in 52 countries. Oh no, it's now 54. 54 countries engaged in defending women's rights. If you would like to get involved in WHRC Women's Human Rights Campaign, please fill in the form on our website, womensdeclaration.com. This week on Feminist Question Time, we have Gunter Schumann from Germany, uh, Jennifer Bilek from the United States of America, Jacqueline J from US living in Taiwan, who's going to tell us about the situation in Taiwan, and Luba Fine from Israel. I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker today, who is Gunter Schumann. She is from Germany. She is has um, she's going to talk about the settlement of transgender ideology in German politics and law in Germany. Uh, Gunda is a lesbian activist from LAZ Reloaded, Laz Reloaded. She's a member of the board. Uh, Gunda Schumann is a lawyer, sociologist and author. Um, so thank you so much for coming and telling us about what's happening in Germany. Over to you, Gunda. I will talk today about four topics. The main title is Emerging of Self-ID in Germany. We have a liberal left-wing government in the future, and this is very, very real that we will have a kind of self-ID law in Germany very soon. Anyway, we try our best to fight against this. So I will talk about four topics. The first one, Objection by a woman's organization called Sex Matters, DE, against the election of a male Green Party politician as a female member to the Deutsche Bundestag, that means to the German federal parliament. Second, a mobbing campaign against Leni Breimeyer, a social democratic politician by trans activists, Third, letters by my organization, Lutz Reloaded, to politicians of the working group and the main negotiating group of the coalition parties. Fourth, the coalition agreement of November 24th on queer life. And last not least, some comments on the new state law on law enforcement in Berlin, where uh, trans people are going to be admitted to the women's prison. Okay, first point. Objection by a woman's organization called Sex Matters, in English, of course, against the election of a male Green Party politician as a female member to the Deutsche Bundestag. Recently, the woman's organization, in German it's called Geschlechtzelt.de, has filed a claim with the Electoral Board of Deutscher Bundestag against the election of a trans-identified male green politician as a female member to the Deutsche Bundestag. Before the election, he had not applied for change of sex entry in the state registry, but was nevertheless put by the Greens on a voting list position for women. Federal and state election authorities mistakenly assumed that person called Markus Ganserer, 
to be female due to his self-chosen name, Tessa. The background is a loophole in the federal election law. The women's organization Sex Matters argues that this manipulation of voters would violate democratic and procedural principles and damage public trust in the rule of law. In addition, statistics about the female share of members of Deutsche Bundestag would be faked and all efforts to enhance the female share in political bodies thus become obsolete at highest levels. Finally, that policy runs counter to the constitutional obligation by the state to achieving equality between women and men. We are curiously waiting for the decision by the electoral board of Deutsche Bundestag. I will report to WHRC in the future about this. Second, mobbing campaign against Leni Breimeyer, social democratic politician by trans activists. After German federal elections on September 26, three parties, the Social Democrats, the Greens, and the Liberal Democrats, entered into negotiations for a future coalition government. As a first step, 22 working groups got established, containing members of all participating parties to outline the future coalition agreement. After nomination of Leni Breimeyer, a gender critical feminist politician, as chair of the working group on equality diversity by the Social Democrats, the winning party in the federal elections, a shitstorm by trans activists, for example, the subgroup SPD Queer, in social media broke out against her. On October 20th, Lutz Reloaded forwarded a letter to the General Secretary of SPD, Lars Klingbeil, and the group chairman of SPD in the federal parliament, Dr. Ralf Mützenich, requesting to keep Leni, Leni Breimeyer in that prominent position as a feminist politician of outstanding merit. Shortly before the working group was going to kick off in late October, Leni Breimeyer nevertheless has been replaced by Petra Köpping, a specialist for sexual and gender diversity issues as chair of the working group. On November 2nd, Lutz Reload forwarded a solidarity address to Leni Breimeyer expressing its support during these stormy times. She was still in charge for sex equality issues, however. Leni Breimeyer was grateful for the support of Lutz Reloaded. Third, letters by Lutz Reloaded to politicians of the working group and the main negotiating group. On November 6, Lutz Reloaded sent a letter to all members of the working group, Equality Diversity, stressing the fact that the bill on self-ID submitted by the Greens and the Liberal Democrats in 2020 to the federal parliament would not be compatible with the constitutional rights of women, in particular lesbian women, regarding equality with men. For example, loss of safe and autonomous spaces for women, lesbians, when men identifying as women or lesbians will get access. Furthermore, minors, in particular girls, who may not be gender conforming, will suffer severe psychological and physical harm upon informed consent to gender reassignment surgery. After the working group submitted its negotiating results to the main negotiating group in charge to finalize a coalition agreement, Lutz Reloaded sent a letter to the members of that group, mainly leaders of the three parties, for example, Olaf Scholz, future chancellor of the German government, on November autonomous spaces for women lesbians. 
Lesbians in particular would increasingly suffer sexual violence by so-called trans lesbians. Equality of women lesbians would be hampered and their right to bodily and psychological integrity threatened. Before a so-called self-ID law could be enacted, Lutz Reloaded is requesting a broad evidence-based discussion about the amendment of the so-called Transsexuellen Gesetz in Germany, the Gender Recognition Act, and the admission of gender reassignment surgery of minors, taking into consideration the massive impairment of women's, lesbians, and children's rights. As a result, competing rights of women, in particular lesbian women and the protection of minors, would have to be reconciled with the rights of trans persons, guaranteed under the German constitution as well. Fourth topic, coalition agreement of November 24th on queer life. The coalition parties will replace the transsexual Gesetz by a new self-ID law. That would include change of sex entry in the state registry, basically by self-declaration. Furthermore, a broadened and sanctioned prohibition of disclosure of the biological sex by third persons and strengthening of educational and advisory service offers. Costs of gender reassignment surgery are to be borne completely by the state health insurance. However, The text does not disclose whether also minors may change their sex entry in the state registry and whether they may consent to gender reassignment surgery. Furthermore, the law on protection against conversion therapy of 2020, including trans kids, will be tightened. Even guardians would face legal punishment if they try to converse their trans kids. Lutz Reloaded will, together with other women's organizations, organize and or participate in public protests against these intended legal changes, severely impairing women's in particular lesbians' lives. Fifth point, the state law and law enforcement Berlin. On September 25th, the amended Berlin Strafvollzugsgesetz, the law on law enforcement, entered into force, granting a trans or non-binary person access to the prison of the opposite sex on a case-by-case basis. Besides personality and needs of the trans person and the incarceration target, Criteria such as needs of the other prisoners, as well as guarantee of security and order of the institution would have to be considered as well. The law was initiated by the Berlin Justice Senator of the Greens and amended without public debate. Lutz Reloaded heard about it only afterwards. Lutz Reloaded will try to find out by members of the State Parliament of Berlin whether these new provisions have been applied already and what the experiences have been so far. Thanks a lot. Finally, I would like to announce that Lutz Reloaded is a registered trademark since yesterday. Okay. Since we are very often attacked by trans activist organizations, we will have now a very forceful tool to fight against this uh, terrible attacks. Thanks a lot. So our next uh, panelist today is um, Jennifer Bilek from the United States. Jennifer, Um, many of you will know this, but I'll say anyway, is an investigative journalist, artist, and activist living in the United States. She's author of the 11th Hour blog, examining intersections of transgenderism, technology, and capitalism, and reporting on the global gender industry. So we're really happy to have Jennifer on today to chat and to tell us about her work and sort of her insights. into what's happening 
Um, so thank you so much for coming on, Jennifer. And um, I suppose the first thing for some some people might not know about Eleventh Hour Blog. So could you tell us what what Eleventh Hour Blog is and what you've been doing with it, and what you focus on? The Eleventh Hour Blog I started about three years ago now, and um, I was writing about this issue since probably 2013. I came at it because I was working for an environmental organization where people were being um, censored from speaking about the environment <clears throat> um, and biological reality. So um, they had asked me to secure some venues for them in New York, and I did. And very quickly, they were um, disrupted. The venue organizers called me and said, no, actually, we can't um, platform these people. And you know, and I knew it was over this issue because they couldn't speak anywhere else either, which is why they enlisted me to get some venues for them. And so I realized very quickly, this is an awful lot of power, uh, you know, to censor people in this way. And um, so, and, you know, I'm an American, so anything powerful is attached to money. <laughs> so I, of course, think money, you know, and I went looking for the money. And some people were already talking about this very sort of peripherally. Um, and so I picked up on a couple of threads and I just went looking around and the more I looked, the more I found. And I realized that a lot of other people were still talking about, uh, identity and gender and how that plays out socially. Um, and not really a whole lot of people were talking about the industry behind this juggernaut. Um, and what was moving it. So that's why I started the blog because I I've, I've kept finding more and more information about this. And, and I wanted to expose that to other people and get the conversation moving more in that direction because though rights are really important um, and they, you know, women's rights are being decimated around this. Um, I think that most people aren't really like in mainstream they really aren't connected to women's rights. Feminism isn't really in the mainstream anymore. Corporate feminism, perhaps, but not like radical feminism and the analysis of feminism is not really in mainstream culture anymore. And most people I think think, you know, women in the West, you know, especially white women in the West aren't really oppressed anymore. They have all their rights already. What the hell are they screaming about? Right, so it's not really getting through to people because the propaganda machine on the other side is so intense. They have all the money, they have all the power, they have all the tech, and they're driving it 24 seven. My understanding from reading your uh, blog and uh, the stuff you write is that the money seems to be um, sort of accumulated by via big pharma, sort of some pharmaceutical sources but then also some it's just some people who have a lot of money so it seems to be possibly creating markets for the for the future it might be a form of marketing this ideology but then also uh ideologically driven by people who want to change society because they believe in something but is that absolutely accurate? can you tell us more accurately what you think is happening most of the operators the drivers behind this are gay elite gay men and <clears throat> men with the fetish of autogynephilia which is possessing women's biology for themselves um and that seems to have been rebranded under this umbrella of transgenderism i mean autogynephilia and adult male fetish is a very hard sell especially to the youth who this project is really trying to capture. The, um, the whole thrust of this thing, I mean, to really just sort of simplify it and sort of, you know, take out the white noise, I call gender ideology an ideology of disembodiment. It's selling people on disembodiment. And transgender is really just the ad campaign. And they've made transsexualism, which is disembodiment and objectification of female biology, sort of cool you know, by rebranding it to transgenderism. Um, and people are really focused on, you know, they have sort of accepted that narrative instead of going on the offense and going like, what does that mean? What is transgender? Like, and what happened to transsexualism? And why was this added to the LGB? 
and you know who's behind this and what's this going to do for us like nobody asks any of these questions they just accept the narrative right yeah. And that's a dangerous narrative to accept, you yeah. know, because now we're in a position of arguing for women's rights versus transgender rights, when in actuality, there's no such thing as transgender. It's a, it's a corporate fiction yeah. used what, to sell disembodiment. And so the, the, so the I mean, I get why uh, pharmaceutical companies would want to want this environment because they can sell more uh, hormones. And I sort of get why uh, the AGP, the autogynophiles, might want it to be normalized. But I don't quite understand um, what would be driving elite gay men to promote this. And also the other, so there's one I don't quite get, but you might, if you could give us some, some insight. And also, why do um, this disembodiment, I mean, do, do you think people actually, they, they want to fund the ideology because they like disembodiment or is it because there's some other thing that they're going to get money from it or power? I mean, it seems really weird people liking disembodiment. When you think about it in, in context, you know, and part of what's already happened to us, you know, we've already been, you know, divorced, dissociated from our natural environment, from our food source. Um, and more and more invested in technology as we go. So this is really just an extension of that. Um, and in terms of, you know, uh, why would gay men be interested in this? Um, I don't know that it's gay men in general. I think it's really, you know, elite gay men because it's an investment in the future. If you look at um, what's happening to people, they're being de-sexed. You know, young children are being de-sexed with puberty blockers and then a little bit older children are being de-sexed with cross-sex, wrong sex hormones. This actually feeds big fertility down the road. You know, preservation of your sperm, preservation of your, your, um, uh, your eggs, uh, womb implants, you know, I mean, there's a whole industry around women's reproduct reproductive capacities as parts. And that industry is growing and growing, right? So if you have all these gender clinics, which weren't there 10 years ago, now there's like 700 in the, um, in the Northern United States, you know, and 300 of those I think are for children. You know, so when you look at that, industry and then you, you see that other you know the, the same people that are funding these clinics like billionaires they're also investing in big fertility right now for elite gay men i think it's a way to you know it's an investment in us as parts i mean the whole world has been colonized already right so the, really the only thing left is us and the root of us is our sex so basically, that's what's what's happening. This is what capitalism does. It sucks all the wealth up to, towards the top, and then it extracts, you know, what's viable for profiteering. Women are in the way of this process. I mean, be, the extraction and the colonization has happened to us. We are it, you know, because yeah, yeah. You know, they, we have. I mean, we were in, in Marx's terms. They'd sort of say, "Oh, we've been dispossessed from the means of production, so all we have to sell is our labor, and we have to go and be wage slaves. And the only way we can fight back is by being in unions and striking and stuff." And then, the, then we, the feminists, said, "Oh, well, what about the means of reproduction? We've, we, you know, they don't talk about that exploitation, but also our bodies are the means of reproduction, and they've gone right in there. So I suppose you're following the money into." how they're splitting that open into control of the means of reproduction, but not just by, you know, the main, like controlling abortion or reproductive technologies. It's like right in there in our bodies, splitting it. And the concept of us having bodies, yeah. So do you, so in your blog, I just want to sort of go, go you, you're, um, you write in the blog, do you have others who write with you and do you have international contributions um, well, I have written about other countries, you know, solely, but more recently in the past <clears throat> few months, um, Alex Aran of the Gender Mapper Project um, has joined me for, uh, to create a global page on the blog um, where we're inviting contributors from other countries to talk about gender as industry in their countries. 
um, and to sort of move it away from the whole rights framework because you're only fighting for your rights because you've already accepted the violation of the boundary between male and female. And that's not just a, a linguistic boundary or a legal boundary, that's also an actual physical boundary. I mean, women are, have had their sex invaded, you know, colonized, occupied, and um, the extraction is well underway already. So we're not just fighting, you know, for linguistic territory or, you know, legal territory. And, um, you know, the industry has, has come after young women, you know, I mean, there's 40,000 young women on GoFundMe looking for money to have their breasts removed. You know, they're doing hysterectomies for identity purposes on young women, you know, and they're selling them this ideology of disembodiment is cool. You have young women with, you know, scars doing modeling, you know, as men, you know, it's, it's, you know, this process is well underway. It's the capitalist market and it's come for sex. Well, my biggest question is how on earth are you so brave? Because I would be terrified to do, and I think lots of us would be terrified to do the work you've done and are doing. What made you so brave? Well, I have a role in my family as the person that calls out the, um, the elephant in the middle of the living room. So I've been unpopular, you know, from a very <laughs> young age. <laughs> and it's not something I can help. It's part of my nature. So I've just sort of gone along with that. And also, you know, you spoke about Deep Green Resistance. I was involved with that organization for, you know, several years. And um, they really, you know, help activists push the, the boundary on their own comfort level in terms of speaking and, and being an activist. And so I learned a lot about that from, um, from that organization. And, um, you know, courage is really a muscle that you have to, you know, you have to work it or it's not going to work for you. You know, it's so if you exercise it and you keep pushing your own, you know, your own mark further and further, then you just become comfortable. You know, it just gets more comfortable. Wow. Um, that is so fantastic. I, I suppose I want to get, go back to this question about what's driving the funders, profit or ideology. Um, to sort of get more of your insight into that? These men who are very, very wealthy, who have a fetish, are ones that validated, and they have the means to create an ideology around that fetish um, to have it normalized. Um, so I think that that's really driving a lot of this because they are the ones that are sending, you know, billions into cultures all over the world, you know, not just Western, the Western world, but everywhere. I mean, I think the only places that haven't been, you know, colonized yet are the stands, you know, Uzbekistan and whatever the other stands are and Russia, you know, yeah. but, um, there's a political apparatus to drive this ideology globally. And it's working very well. And I think for gay men who have been, who have a lot of power and who have been, you know, um, the subject of shame and ridicule for so many years as, you know, as boys, as effeminate boys and young men, you know, loving other men in a homophobic culture. Um, I think now that they have power, they're wielding it, you know, and they also want to, they believe that, um, you know, they want to sort of put uh, homosexuality on par with heterosexuality. Like we are exactly the same and we are as, as valid. And there is no, there, like it's all the same. Like it's all one big sexuality. Like, like heterosexuality isn't over here, do you know? But in fact, heterosexuality is the way that we reproduce the species. It's not a supremacy. It's the way yeah. that we reproduce the species where a lot of a lot of gay women or uh, lesbian women went and um, and got power, you know, through the human rights organizations for LGB, you know, they built culture, you know, they built, um, you know, lesbian cruise line and lesbian bookstores and lesbian music festivals, you know, whereas men went into corporatism, you know, so they built up a lot of power within the society, you know, gay men. I mean, and, you know, if you look at like the two uh, largest LGBT organizations in the United States, one founded by John Stryker, a gay male, and the other one founded by Tim Gill, also a gay man, um, 
you know, uh, Tim Gill was um, doing a presentation for John Stryker. I think it was at GLAD, um, at the annual GLAD um, awards ceremony. And he was saying that how they're friends and how they, they, um, they hang out together and they do their work together and they punish the wicked. And I thought that that was really an interesting statement, you know, like that's a little, you know, extreme for, <laughs> you know, what, the, what he was making reference to. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that, you know, that's, um, they want to put like all sexuality and anything sexual on par with each other so that nothing is hierarchical. They try to normalize fetish. You know, like now they're bringing in MAP, you know, minor attracted people for pedophiles. And they're bringing in all sorts of kink. And if you look under the transgender umbrella, there's all this fetishization under there. But that's also about commerce because commerce is about, you know, breaking things into new markets and breaking things apart and breaking them down so that you open markets, right? Yeah. So fetishization, you know, of sex does this you know, it, it creates, you know, everything into parts because fetishization is really objectification, commodification, um, it's compulsory, it's dissociative, it, you know, it, it obstructs intimacy. It's all a process that, that technology and commerce as they're sewn together has already, you know, is already perpetuating. It's just basically on steroids now. Is, what are you gonna do next? Um for it with 11th hour blog and your work you know i've spent um quite a few years now trying to help people see the the link to pharma to big pharma and how big that really is like i think other people in other countries don't quite get how big big pharma is <laughs> but in america we eat that with our cereal in the morning you know it's in our face all the time it's huge they control everything they're connected to the media they're connected to Everybody. I mean, the, the technologies and industries, you know, they work all hand in hand with big pharma. So, but I don't think a lot of people like really get that, but I think they're starting to get that now because a lot of people, you know, in my social media feed will come up with their own stuff now and they're doing their own research around this. And it's really, really great. I love to see this, but they, now they are, they're, um, you know, now they're going, they're looking askance at the whole transhumanist angle which is also an organic sort of organic. Well, <laughs> it's an obvious development from everything that, you know, has been happening to us thus far, you know, the biomedical intrusion into our lives and into our bodies, you know, is happening on other fronts as well. But um, yeah, so the, the natural or the, the most obvious progression from that is to, to go further and meld us with technology yeah. Um, and that's being talked about and discussed all over the place, but it's just not really connected. Like people don't really see the connection to gender. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And this whole project of gender identity and how it's connected there. But yeah. if you have a whole ideology that you're sending around the globe and everybody's just jumping on this bandwagon very, very rapidly, you've got to know it's going somewhere. I mean, they're not changing the entire culture for a minuscule part of the population that has, you know, dysphoria about their genitalia, like that's completely yeah. mind-bendingly absurd, okay? Yeah. That, you know, like corporations care, big investment houses care, you know, the medical industrial complex, like everybody cares all at once, you know, and very yeah. quickly. And is there anything that uh, WHRC attendees here um, can do, could do to help or um, support your work? Is, is there a way that we can, uh, have you got a donations button on the 11th There hour is a month? donations button on the site that comes up pretty quickly, but you know, um, I really, really need people to, to look at the industry inside of your own countries and how it's playing out there. You know, just broaden your scope, you know, outside the whole rights framework and into the industry, you know, the gender clinics, you know, who is funding what? How is it connected to big fertility? How is it connected to big pharma? You know, how are they marketing it? How are they selling it? Are there trans modeling agencies in your countries like there are over here? Is there transgender makeup like there is over here? I mean, it's everywhere. They're selling it in the market. It's obvious and it's everywhere that this is commerce. 
And I think that, you know, we're going to have a much broader constituency paying attention to our, you know, to the pro-reality movement if we can, you know, expose the industry. Our next panellist is Jacqueline Jay. She's from the USA. She lives in Taiwan. Uh, originally from Hawaii, USA, she's, uh, Jacqueline is now based in Taiwan. She's a PhD student in the field of feminist philosophy. She's a university lecturer and a published writer, a budding activist working in the field of women's rights and gynocritical research. She's created and manages one of the only feminist focused book clubs in Taiwan, volunteers with various <laughs> nonprofit organizations and is a voracious reader. She loves traveling, ancient and medieval history, critical thinking and challenging the status quo. So um, Jacqueline's going to tell us about what's happening in Taiwan. It's the first time that we've had somebody uh, talking to us from Taiwan, so it's totally brilliant. As a signatory of the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, I am very privileged to be here to talk about uh, what is happening in Taiwan. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of people are talking about this issue, so I think it's, it's great to have this on this platform. So I'm going to be discussing gender ideology uh, gender identity legislation in Taiwan, uh, which is something that really only started to take form earlier this year. And in case you're wondering why I am talking about Taiwan, I am a legally a permanent resident of Taiwan, originally from Hawaii, but I've been living here since 2008. Uh, so earlier this year, I was actually contacted by several people who volunteer with different LGB organizations uh, in Taiwan about the issue of self-ID. And I was completely unaware that this was happening. English news outlets were not covering the story. Uh, the details were sparse. And after getting together with different sources in the government, uh, different sources in LGB organizations, I was able to write a very detailed article about this issue. And luckily enough, my story was published in Feminist Current. So far, it is the only outlet for any news on this topic that's written by someone in Taiwan that talks about the negative effects that self-ID can have on the populace, on women. Interesting fact, right after I published that article on Feminist Current, my Medium, uh, my Medium uh, page profile where I had been writing, I was deplatformed for hate speech. So uh, after previously winning an award on Medium for being a top writer in feminism, they deleted my account. So that article definitely pushed some buttons. Uh, so to go into details about what is happening in Taiwan, uh, on September 23rd of this year, the Taipei High Administrative Court issued a ruling which allowed a trans-identified male to change his legal sex to female without uh, so-called sex reassignment surgery. And that is the first of its kind in Taiwan. It has never happened before. And it sort of came out of the blue. For more than 20 years, the only legal way to change your sex was very complex, very difficult, very few people did it. And it included having to do things like uh, removing reproductive organs, completion of sex reassignment surgery, living as the opposite sex for at least two years, having the support of parents and family, being between the age of 20 and 40, and having a uh, IQ score between 85 to 115. So there were a lot of rules. And between 2008 and 2020, there were discussions on changing this law, but there was no solid plan enacted. Okay? So what happened this year really came out of the blue. And the question I asked myself was, how did this ideology suddenly take hold, seemingly out of nowhere? And it appears that certain groups in Taiwan have been working basically in excuse me, secrecy to make this happen which I'll explain a little bit more about later. So to give you some background about Taiwan, in case you're not familiar with the country, uh, the last three decades to see Taiwan join the ranks of the most vibrant democracies in Asia. Uh, since the 90s, democracy and respect for human rights have become an increasingly prominent part of the island's identity and values, which is one of the reasons why I chose to live here. Uh, for example, Taiwan became the very first country in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage, and that happened in May of 2019, and I was there at the marches and the rallies and the pride parades leading up to that monumental victory for equality. 
So when well-meaning people in Taiwan, when the average Taiwanese person hears trans rights, they assume something similar to gay rights is being asked for, is being presented. But as we all know, that isn't the case. And what campaigners mean by trans rights, as we know, is the right to identify as the opposite sex, socially, legally, and in every other context, which is not something that is being made clear to the Taiwanese populace. So the Chinese news outlets that have covered this case uh, all did so with no comment on how these changes would impact women in Taiwan. Uh, across the board, they just copy and pasted statements from groups that represented trans activist interest, offered no counter opinion or discussion of potential harm to women or girls. And uh, the English language news outlets were even worse. Uh, they had the barest of details. And of course, they failed to discuss any negative impacts. Uh, according to a Taiwanese source that I spoke to, who is active in the LGB community, of course, all of the people who came to me uh, preferred to remain anonymous because they see what's happening in the West. And a lot of these people have prominent positions. Um, they're lawyers, they work in the government. Uh, so last year, uh, Taiwan's highest administrative branch decided to fund research on public opinion regarding gender self-ID or sex self-ID. But this research is being led, ironically, by a gender studies department at a local Taiwanese university. The project is called the Legalization of Gender Change Requirements and Legislative Suggestions, and it aims to assess public and or LGB community opinions on self-ID requirements to provide the government direction on possible legislative change. And the research is being compiled through a series of questions conducted online through a Google form. Okay, so according to the sources that I've spoke with who work for the government, the research is strongly biased towards requiring only self-declaration of identity. Okay, it's been translated for me into English and it's heavily biased. Uh, the research is costing, by the way, it's costing the Taiwanese government 1.3 million Taiwanese dollars, which is roughly 37,000 uh, US. And the survey seems by design difficult to find unless you're in the know. Uh, the government official who reached out to me personally had trouble finding this Google form. And unlike the general public, he actually knew what to search for. So searching online for information on the research being conducted, if you were to go search right now, or for the survey, the only thing you would find uh, would be the institutions, information on the institutions who bidded to conduct the research. The only actual links to the form are found on transgender or LGBTQ related forums. The organizations behind the research, again, gender studies program at Taiwanese University, uh, do not seem interested in including the general public and are heavily biased only in seeking out participation from a very few select groups. Why are they doing this? Convincing people to accept identities that are entirely subjective and have no basis in material reality is not an easy task, which is probably why this recent ruling was a surprise to so many in Taiwan, myself included. If you want everyone to accept your gender identity as valid, then the populace must be persuaded that sex bodies are not material and that gender identities are. And if you think you can't convince your populace, then you will try to push through laws without their knowledge and without their informed consent. And it's very disappointing for me uh, living here to see a thriving democracy like Taiwan circumvent discussion on this topic and use sleight of hand to pass a law that will negatively impact its citizens. And it's very reminiscent of its recent authoritarian past under the guise of being exclusive, in, yeah, inclusive, sorry, inclusive. And it's disappointing to see that women's organizations here and the general public have been completely left out of the conversation. The government should be able to provide legal protections for trans identified people without eroding the legal status, the rights and the existence of women. As we all know, language matters because that is how we describe reality. And when we erase the meaning of the word woman, we erase women the oppression that we as women face and the rights that women have fought for. The good news is there is a huge backlash being felt. A very big backlash is happening. Um, 
It started on social media. Um, the popular Asian social media platform called Plurk. It's very popular in Taiwan. You may not have heard of it. I hadn't heard of it until recently. They found my, my article on Feminist Current. They took it. They translated it word by word into Chinese. They posted it all over social media. And this was perhaps the first time that many Taiwanese people had even heard of this issue. Um, they've seen the details and had someone actually describe the reality of how this could negatively impact them. <clears throat> so young, liberal, educated Taiwanese people, they want to protect the rights of trans people, but they absolutely do not want to accept self-ID and intact males in female spaces. Uh, many of the Taiwanese that I've spoken to just want to maintain the status quo. Uh, the status quo being the rules that were in place for the past few decades. Um, so the Taiwanese women who have read this article, they started to form groups to discuss what was happening and they started to organize. They did it very quickly. They started a campaign using the messaging app Line. If you're not familiar with Line, it's probably the most popular messaging app that we have here in Taiwan. Um, and they were telling their friends, their family, members of the community to contact local legislators to complain about this verdict. And you know, wondering why, why have they been strategically left out of this conversation? So the women leading this online campaign against self-ID, I've spoken to many of them, they're highly educated, um, lawyers, women working in LGB activism, told me that the country's major parties have failed to support women, saying that the current administration has went completely silent after previously pledging feminist policies. So they're using their own time and money and they're fighting back. So one of the main ways that they have been fighting back is they started to distribute leaflets, uh, explaining the ruling and its implications. These are some of the flyers. There, there are quite a few. I'll go ahead and, and show them to you. So uh, they started uh, distributing leaflets, like the one that you see on the screen by hand. Thousands of these pamphlets were distributed by anti-self-ID feminists in Taiwan all around the city, um, which was very impressive. They printed out thousands of them, went on their scooters, went all around the city, did it by hand. Uh, concerned citizens also created an online petition to appeal the ruling on self-ID on account of wanting to protect women-only spaces. As of, this is great news, as of November 27th, they hit their goal of 5,000 signatures. As of now, it's well over that. And only about 5% of online petitions in Taiwan meet their signature goal. So very impressive. And as a result, the government is now forced to publicly address the petition and the concerns mentioned in it. This was a, another a flyer that was being distributed um, talking about the harms of gender identity, uh, how it would harm women. So I was lucky enough to interview some of these women leading these, these, this fight, this new campaign against self-ID, and they wish to remain anonymous, of course, to avoid being targeted for harassment, but they're very eager to get their voices heard because their voices are not being heard in Taiwan. News outlets are not speaking to them. Their voices, their side of the story isn't being heard. Prior to self-ID being pushed in Taiwan, many of these women were not familiar with feminism, they were hesitant to refer to themselves as feminists. Uh, one woman that I interviewed, Miss Liu, who has personally handed out nearly 2,000 flyers warning about self-ID, said that I didn't consider myself to be a feminist before this movement hit. At first, I never even heard of self-ID and had no idea what it was about. After doing some research, I understood how deep the problem went and how it could really impact us. Uh, another source that I spoke to, Ms. Lin, said something similar. She said, I didn't walk the street for any feminist issues in the past. I did talk about and argue about feminist and gender issues on the internet, but as far as starting a real social movement, this is my first time. I looked up the vocabulary gender critical and decided this is where I stand. Uh, this is probably my favorite flyer because it just gets straight to the point. This one's not pulling any punches. Did you know the first woman with a penis has appeared in Taiwan and he is able to enter women's bathrooms, dorms, changing rooms, hot springs, etc. And this really made an impact when it came out because yeah, it's very, very direct. Uh, 
I asked whether this new form of activism is spreading in Taiwan. And another source, Ms. Chen said, at a certain pace, yes, but obviously not fast enough since it clashes with the recent trend of the LGBTQ inclusive agenda that was forced to be adopted by many mainstream Taiwanese feminists, human rights groups, and the Taiwanese government. So on gender critical movements, feminists don't uh, Taiwanese don't necessarily think that deep into the issue. It looks very distant to the average Taiwanese person, which creates a problem because it's harder to gain momentum when we need to spread awareness. Uh, but since the first self-ID verdict showed up, I believe it is possible for this movement to grow and continue growing. Uh, and I actually had a discussion last night uh, with this, the same source, Ms. Chen, and they're in the process right now of setting up Taiwan's first national organization for, uh, I don't think they have a title yet, but gender critical, radical feminist, anti-self-ID feminism, and they're in the process of setting that up now. This has really galvanized them. And it's really amazing to see what a small but growing number of women can achieve so quickly and under you know, adverse circumstances, with very little support. And I think it really reflects the strengths of Taiwan's women's collective energy and determination. And I expect that more and more women are going to be empowered by those that are brave enough to speak out against self-ID in Taiwan. And I really appreciate all of the people that came forward to come and speak to me about this issue. And as Jennifer said earlier, and I loved that, courage is a muscle. That's absolutely on point. And Taiwanese women are definitely flexing that muscle right now. And it's really brilliant to see. Okay, well, we're going to go now to our uh, fourth panelist, who is Luba Fine. Luba's from Israel. She is a signatory of the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, and she is not ready yet to talk to us. She's sent off uh, some uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, requests to find out what's happening more in Israel and is finding out. So one day in the future, in the next few months, will come and talk to us about gender identity. But she's going to talk to us on her actual specialist area on uh, prostitution and the sex trade and uh, tell us about the Nordic model. Hi, uh, my name is Luba Fine. I'm a sex trade survivor and a, a, an abolitionist. Uh, I was an active campaigner uh, for the Nordic model in Israel where uh, it was uh, officially adopted uh, uh, three years ago and enforced actively in the beginning of this year. My country is in eight, eight Nordic model country. And uh, today I have joined this meeting to talk, ab to talk about our abolitionist struggle during the last 20 years and uh, about the Nordic model implementation in Israel so far. The real awakening started in my country at the beginning of the third millennium. We had some uh, abolitionist activism even before that, but uh, it was neither popular nor uh, really understood by the masses. However, in the late 90s, the situation was significantly affected by the economic and political instability in Eastern Europe. Many Eastern European countries have become a source of sex trafficking. Uh, traffickers deceived the women, Eastern European women by promising fair jobs and then smuggled them from countries like Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, and other countries to Israel, via the Egyptian border. When the women reached the, here, they became the captives of pimps. The criminals confiscated the victims' passports, locked them into the brothels, threatened to kill their families. Many women were forced to accept 36, 36 buyers, yes, up to 30 per day, and received a very negligible payment. And it happened here in Israel 20 years ago, which is like, uh, feels like a different world. So in the beginning, the authorities and the public ignored the problem completely. Everyone uh, thought the brothels were never legal. Nobody enforced that legislation. In 2000, a, a religious fanatic set on fire a brothel in Tel Aviv in which four women died. And uh, it turned out that the women couldn't escape because they were jailed. 
they were locked in the brothel. The bodies have never been identified, which means that to that day, somewhere in Eastern Europe, we have families who do not know where their loved ones they disappeared. Uh, so there was some sh very brief public shock in response to that event, but uh, it was soon forgotten. In 2001, Israel was ranked third tier in the trafficking in persons report of the United States Department. This report is published annually and it includes information on the sex trafficking situation in every country. Uh, every government is ranked according to the effort invested in, invested in eradicating the trade. And Israel received the worst score because our local abolitionists contacted the United States Department of State and insisted that our ranking will be downgraded. Following that report, a coalition of uh, human rights NGOs, aid NGOs, lobbyist politicians was established. Most uh, activists were obviously female. Until uh, 2006, the coalition has focused only on foreign sex trafficking. In uh, 2003, there was founded the Task Force on Human Trafficking and Prostitution, a crucial player in our struggle against the sex trade, a lobby group. So the anti-trafficking stage of our Nordic model battle ended uh, in 2006 with a significant streamlining of, of anti-trafficking legislation and enforcement. After that, uh, the member of parliament, Zahava Galon, probably the most prominent politician in this battle, proposed the Nordic model bill in the first time, for the first time. She wanted to leverage uh, the anti-trafficking momentum and promote the general sex purchase ban. But that time, uh, not many people supported it. Right-wing politicians probably ignored it because it was associated with the left wing. And uh, many NGOs and even uh, well-meaning individuals felt that uh, solving the foreign trafficking is enough, uh, local prostitution is, uh, is not a real problem. In those days, uh, we didn't have uh, enough examples to follow. Only Sweden enforced uh, the sex purchase ban at uh, that time. So since uh, enforcing the Nordic model was not uh, feasible yet, we compromised on uh, intermediate achievements. For, for 10 years or so, we just uh, took uh, anything we could uh, achieve, not, not everything or nothing, anything we, we, we could achieve. Uh, in 2008, uh, the authorities uh, funded and established our first exit services. We didn't have sex purchase ban, but we did have exit services more than a dozen years ago. <clears throat> and the, the budget has gradually increased. Uh, another example, in, uh, since uh, 2015, there started a battle against strip clubs. A, pr a president ruling from 2017 claimed that lap dance in strip clubs equals prostitution services. After several attempts to restrict the uh, strip clubs to, to the dancing only, all of them were shut down by local authorities in, in uh, a year ago, yeah, when, uh, more than a year ago when COVID started. One more example, in 2017, we passed a bill banning websites uh, that uh, promote or conduct illegal activity, including advertising of prostitution. This law uh, it didn't provoke uh, riots like the Nordic model bill, but uh, it, it is a very important law. In, uh, in the battle against the sex trade. <clears throat> in uh, 2013, we established a wide coalition, right wing and left wing against prostitution. Uh, we used a, a very special framing for that. Uh, like uh, I can say, I read sometimes articles from Scandinavia and I see that uh, prostitution are uh, rightfully framed as the uh, oppression of women by men. But uh, here to establish a right-wing, left-wing coalition, it, it, it just couldn't work. So prostitution was framed as a violence against women, as abuse, sexual abuse of women, abuse of marginalized women. So conservatives could identify with this idea and join uh, the left-wing parties to support the Nordic model. In December, 2018, 
it was passed officially will be very challenging to determine when uh, the actual enforcement started because the act has uh, two main purposes so first purpose is enforcement against the sex buyers right currently uh, the purchase of sex is punished by a fine only after a third arrest uh, the uh, state can initiate some criminal action by the way the sex buyers can replace this fine uh, by uh, by a, with a workshop but uh, the spoiler nobody opted for that they just they don't want to become better people <laughs> they prefer to pay the fine <laughs> anyway the police had to delay the enforcement for a long time because our former minister of interior security did not support the nordic model and the, the task force on human trafficking and prostitution appealed to the Supreme Court to force him to sign the order. Uh, after that, uh, police uh, forces uh, has, have undergone the training, the, and the training was focused on understanding that women in prostitution are victims. They are not uh, mean or annoying or dirty, they are victims. And uh, recently I have seen a police officer uh, interviewed on TV and uh, he said, during this training, we learned that women in prostitution are actually victims. And I, I was so happy to hear these words because uh, this is not what I remember from my time in the sex trade. But uh, still, I'm not complacent. I know that we have to keep working and, and uh, uh, organize more training, but the beginning is very good. So the first report was handed out to the lucky customer in February, and uh, now we have uh, more than 1,000 reports and uh, counting. The second component of the Nordic model in Israel and in general is uh, obviously exit and support services. Again, will be very challenging to point out when this part of the law was enforced because uh, we already had rehab and support services. So we are, we are speaking uh, about uh, expanding budgets, expanding support services. As for now, we have uh, uh, amazing options of, for, for the sex trade survivor, survivors who are willing to exit, including legal assistance, bureaucracy, psychiatric, psychological counseling, individual group therapy, parent training, exercise and social rights, which is very important, workshops for financial management, I think I still need it, vocational training, educational integration, rehabilitation hostels, and much, much more. We also have a range of services often referred as uh, harm reduction such as uh, helping with the necessities, uh, food, uh, clothes, paying bills, emergency apartment where women can uh, shower, change clothes, eat, eat and sleep for uh, women in active prostitution. And something very interesting, there is a question often discussed, whether uh, we, how we should uh, support women who are still in prostitution, whether they should be encouraged to exit. And in many countries, especially those that don't believe in the Nordic model. They, be, they think that initiating a conversation about exit services is judgmental. But our perspective is different and I, I believe different. Our harm reduction services are offered unconditionally. Everyone can get them, no matter what your situation is. The atmosphere is non-judgmental, but every woman in prostitution is informed that she can opt for exit services whenever she feels like. And I strongly believe in this approach because every woman in the sex trade should know that others believe in her ability to exit. Sometimes she doesn't dare to, to, to dream of exiting because the self-image and the self-efficacy in the sex trade are extremely low. So hearing from a volunteer or especially a social worker that they believe in you, it can make tremendous change. Uh, while we are trying to get more funding for the existing services, uh, more uh, creative and innovative solutions for the sex trade survivors are coming up. Uh, one uh, such initiative aims to eliminate criminal records for survivors. I know that you have this problem in the UK. 
in, in Israel, prostitution uh, has never been a, a criminal offense, but we have many prostitution related violations like attacking a police officer, holding weapons, or ridiculous charges like interrupting the traffic by standing on a road. So because of these criminal records, some of them are ridiculous, some maybe not, but women cannot start opening a new page in their life. So we, uh, we help them to delete those criminal records. Another amazing initiative is debt setting. Many women in prostitution exit with large financial debts due to substance abuse, compensatory behaviors, exploitation by pimps and often families, dysfunctional lifestyle and more and more and more other reasons. So this year, I uh, saw the launch of a new project of debt setting for women who exit prostitution. Uh, women participate in the project and they're supported and consulted by the Ministry of Justice, female employee, only female employee who, under, who has undergone special training. And the, that employee helps to reduce the total debt. Some, some parts are eliminated, especially to the institutions. Some parts are divided uh, into installments. And uh, one more project I wanted to uh, mention, it is still under developing, a shortened procedure to acquire the disability status in social security for prostitution survivors. I do not know what is going on in your countries, but in Israel, if you want to be recognized as disabled by the National Insurance Institute, you have to be the most functional person in the world. You should be extremely functional because the, the bureaucra bureaucratic process is lengthy and uh, torturous. So our aid and support NGOs have warned the national insurance that prostitution sur survivors cannot deal with the committees and psychiatrists. Some of them are not very sensitive. And uh, right now we are working on uh, shortening this procedure. So the sex trade survivor can appear to, in, in, to the national institution, National Insurance Institute with a recommendation from the social worker and get the disability status. This is extremely important. Of course, it is not all optimistic. We have many challenges and obstacles. For example, as the public debate about prostitution as violence it intensifies, more and more women are coming to, to exit NGOs. They turn to aid organizations and we have more budgets and more infrastructure, which is never enough. Another problem is attempts to repeal the anti-prostitution laws. There was one appeal to the High Court against the Web Blocking Act. Allegedly, that appeal was uh, by the women who advertised their prostitution services. They all were anonymous. But uh, I can understand that. What I cannot understand that the actual website owners did, disappeared from the appeal and from the media. Why? Because, the, because they know that nobody likes pimps. So they hide behind the backs of women they exploit. Anyway, the appeal was rejected. And now we have another appeal by individual strippers who demand the reopening of strip clubs. And again, the strip club's owner owners disappear from the media, from the media discourse, from the court, like, it is like they don't exist. So sadly, we don't have time to talk about all our channel challenges, but I can say that we will stand firm together and will not go anywhere until the last of the brothels shuts down. The two topic, gender identity and uh, uh, sex trade, they are intertwined because uh, I, I, as I understand it, uh, the both issues stem from one big problem. And the problem is violating female boundaries, the gender ideology and the, the pro-sex trade movements. They are extremely focused on uh, violating female bo uh, borders and feminism, radical feminism. Sex trade abolitionism is all about our borders. We, we will decide in, uh, uh, the access to our bodies cannot be purchased. Access to our uh, in intimate spaces cannot be negotiated. So obviously there always will be a big clash. And, uh, and, and another uh, 
like another common ground between uh, the two uh, very toxic movements is uh, objectification of women. When a woman is an object, you can wear her, you can uh, pretend to be her, you can play her, and you can also buy her because she is not human. Her body, the access to her body, again, can be purchased and negotiated. This is a big, big problem in in uh, in country like ours. I will uh, come with better conclusions. But right now, we promoted the sex purchase ban only by focusing on on uh, actual victims of on uh, uh, victims of prostitution. And uh, I don't want to, to wait for victims of gender ideology. I know that we will have them. Ten years later, we will have them. But I don't want to wait for them.